Well, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Bevel, and I am the Chief Information Security Officer with InfoSystems located in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I am excited to be joined today by Mackenzie Brown, who is the Vice President of Black Point Cyber's Adversary Pursuit Group. Um, and as you can see, Mackenzie's joining me. She has been a thought leader for Black Point and representing really all of their product ecosystem, which she'll talk a little bit about more in a few minutes. Also, she also comes from a very unique and interesting background, which I think she'll bring a lot to the table today with instant response, including global support um, and navigating how to deal with advanced investigations from a small little company everybody knows by the name of Microsoft. Uh, she's also a member of the advisory board member for the Idaho Women in Technology, as well as she's had an exciting year, which she's been awarded the CRN Channel Chief and listed in the Women of Channel for 2023 and 2024. So, Mackenzie, thanks for joining me today. It's exciting to have you here. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much, Chris. So, today, guys, what Mackenzie and I are going to touch on is we were going to talk about kind of mastering the storm and, and do somewhat of an instant response and, and talk about the importance of doing instant response testing, uh, having a managed detection and response program, and then really having an overall instant response and business continuity plan. However, um, as many of you guys know, there was some excitement that took place on the morning of July 19th as CrowdStrike released a, a, a patch which similarly basically took down basically Windows servers and virtual machines and pretty much endpoints across the board. So you heard a lot about it. So we've kind of called a little bit of a, an audible. And what we're going to do is touch base a little bit on the CrowdStrike uh, situation and, and how you could have managed that and what you did. And then we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about instant response and business continuity as well. But, you know, Mackenzie, just to get us started, um, you know, from your perspective, you've been following it and what you do. Give us a kind of a brief summary on what you saw and what you observed from the just the crowd strike incident as a whole. Well, I was um, quite literally packing in my suitcase and heading to the airport in Denver. Um, thankfully, I had an Air Canada flight, so Air Canada was fine. I mean, they their systems went down at the airport, but they had one woman working the gate and the one system was up and zero people in line. So I kind of just breezed by through the chaos of all the blue screen of death that was all around me. And uh, it was it was pretty chaotic. But it was interesting to see even on the flight watching, you know, the market news and seeing the stock tank and then on LinkedIn and reading the updates. And then I've got my team sending me updates. Um, from the reverse engineering side of looking at what was actually going on. And I, I honestly, I think it's like glass houses, right? We're, we're a software company. There's a lot of vendors out there. There's a lot of organizations out there where it, this could happen to anyone. You could push out one large update. And honestly, you know, we saw we working from the Microsoft detection and response team doing incident response. We worked often side by side with the CrowdStrike incident response team, and they did a lot of really good work out there. So this is this entire event is unfortunate. Anything gets more show just showing empathy for the IT providers that are out there working or were out there working all night. And a lot of organizations were able to come back up online, no problem. But if you think about it's actually the opposite from the smaller to medium businesses. It's now the, the larger ones that are having to deal with it, um, you know knock on wood delta being one of them because now i'm a little bit worried about my flight home uh i'm just gonna have to spend a little more time here in new york so i i think that this could happen to a lot of people and i think it's just um uh it's interesting to see from a response perspective the communications aspect of it and that was a big part of incident response too for my world is you know whether you're talking pr or customer communications there was so little information in the beginning and then it started growing and the impact you have from a third party or a vendor having an outage like this and you now supporting your customers, right? The downstream customer effect of that, you want to have some more information. So not only can you bring your systems online, but any of your dependencies or trusts or other companies that you work with that might be dependent upon your infrastructure, right? Or you might be an MSP supporting all many customers. You want to have a plan in place. And so that that's the interesting part of it to me is it's a different type of thing that 
test your business continuity plan. But I think this is going to completely flip business continuity plans when it when it takes a look at third party vendors. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, we're going to get into, you know, is the response and business continuity plans in a little bit. I think one of the things from my perspective that was so unique is I think when we got up and we heard, oh, CrowdStrike had experienced this incident, you you know, because we're in cybersecurity, a lot of times your brain just immediately goes to cybersecurity. And it's like, oh, man, what what has happened? You know, what is one of the one of the, one of the countries done that has attacked to us, particularly when you hear blue screen of death? You know, it's like, okay, what, what has occurred? And, you know, it's shocking that, that unfortunately it pushed out. What's amazing is it was really the, the push, it was really only out there for a little over 78 minutes. I mean, they, they pushed it. It was out for 78 minutes. They, they tried to recall it as quick as they could. Um, and, and I think luckily I'm glad for them that they were able to grab it that quickly because it, it, it probably caused less damage overall or less challenges overall for a lot of people that maybe their systems had not updated. Because really what I think we're seeing is the people that the patch automatically went in and they had already upgraded, it wasn't like they could just simply go back. And, you know, here's here's just an amazing stat from this. Um, we, we're hearing all this stuff across the news and, you know, we're, we're like, wow, what has occurred? But... Microsoft released today and, and through CrowdStrike over the course of the weekend estimated that the update affected 8.5 million devices. So that sounds like a ton. But what's interesting is it was less than 1% of all the Windows machines that that is on the market <laughs> and using it today. And it's like, wow, okay, that is just phenomenal. And, you know, for CrowdStrike, you know, you feel for those guys um, having a son that's a software engineer, you, you know, you feel for the person that did it. And, you know, there was nothing malicious by it. And, and you know, the, the good news is I'm glad they're they're being able to work around it. So what do you think some of the impact uh, of the incident on CrowdStrike to the operations and customers and, and maybe the reputation might be? Oh, I mean, impact. Well, I think the biggest impact that's going to be that people don't realize is, you know, they verify that it's not a security based incident or attack, but that doesn't mean that there's not security considerations. So in my mind, I'm thinking availability and integrity of systems after the fact. And what we're seeing now, too, is we're seeing an increase. Everyone's seen there in spoof domains and phishing attempts, new social engineering that's getting pushed out. That's always going to be a likely phase one level of attack vectors in an incident like this. But I think it's going to be the long-term um, monitoring of systems that, well, there was actually this joke that went around that um, all the threat actors also woke up that day and were upset that all their like C2 and compromised devices were dropped. And they're like, wait, <laughs> what the heck? So they also got the blue screen of death likely. So we're all in the same boat for camaraderie, I guess, at one point. But um, it, that availability of systems and the effects of it for, you know, whatever recovery time objective every single organization out there is going to have. But I do see that now is going to be we're going to be starting to shift as systems come back in line online. There's going to be a, a heavier focus by threat actors on focusing on uncertain organizations that might be using Falcon in and of itself. Yeah, and that, and, you know, it's it's interesting that the cyber guys are going to come in. And one of the things that I immediately started thinking about too was insurance. You know, what is this going to do with cyber insurance, with everybody's insurance ratings? And it was interesting yeah. that right before, right before we got together, you know, I was able to do a little research and the Fitch ratings, which is who does global insurance actually came out and they, they believe that it's going to have a very minimal impact across the global insurance components, which is, it's as exciting news, truthfully. You know, we have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, whatever. We have these big, you know, insurance components. And, and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, what is the impact going to be across the board? But the reality was Fitch doesn't believe that because really the lives that were probably most affected were business interruption, you know, contingent business interruption. And because of it, it touched on like minor things like travel insurance or event cancellations. And really those things were already, you know, in place and it wasn't a cyber attack. It was really just, you know, a unfortunate IT incident. 
one of the interesting things that I thought, you know, as I was I was doing that research, that I hadn't really thought of either. Another good thing for I guess us here in the United States is it happened overnight. And yeah. if you think about the fact that it happened overnight, we were asleep. So really, APAC and the EMEA regions were the ones that were disrupted um, throughout the course of, of their time, which is which is just crazy. Uh, you know, we're lucky because you mentioned Delta. I think I saw some of the other ones that it was the, you know, Best Buy. Uh, so I guess their Geek Squad was really geeking out on that, you know, trying to <laughs> not being funny about the geek squad, but they, you know, you know, when you go in, they get all excited when you take your computer in for something, but right. you, you know, overall they, uh, you know, you had uh, capital one was down and some of the others. So we were really lucky. So let's talk about, you know, how lucky we were. How do you think, and how do you feel that CrowdStrike did in responding to the incident? Um, well, that's a loaded one. I, I, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like they did the best they could considering it, right? It's such a, it's more the, it feels like such a minor thing that caused a enormous impact. If you really look at it, just one, that poor software engineer that maybe is no longer working there, but <laughs> this was their first day. Who knows? Um, I think CrowdStrike's response was... I don't think you could have responded in any other way. I think mm -hmm. um, the transparency was good. If anyone follows, you know, their CISO, Sean Henry, he's amazing. He's former FBI. Um, he's a really, really fantastic person. And he his post he put on LinkedIn of really just breaking down um, just the, the failing, you know, admitting the failing of the organization and admitting like we messed up. It sucks. This is really unfortunate. And this is unfortunate because there are so many people at CrowdStrike that do work really hard. They have stopped major cyber attacks. They have investigated around the world, just like other IR teams. Um, and they have done a significant amount of work. I mean, if I was to rate a lot of the EDRs out there between its MDE and its Falcon, like all the rest are down here. So if you look at it from a technology stance too, they've done fantastic work. And so I think their response is kind of the I don't think there was any good way to respond to that outside of trying to, I think what they could have done that was more proactive was finding the unique ways that would have supported um, infrastructure that is flat networks, infrastructure that are in, like if you look at the airports, right, individual, actual individual computer systems for each and every TV, but then thinking who's going to reach that TV to actually do the reboot and uh, considerations that I think, you know, naming it specifically on a Windows system process was also over and over again, not helpful. And I do think also um, the considerations around BitLocker and just assuming that people have good practices around knowing what their BitLocker keys are and how to do that. So you know, we had posted, we we found, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the person right now, unfortunately, but we had reposted uh, something that someone on Reddit had built out, which was that uh, a really good way to do a bootable USB drive to get it out there and move fast. But a lot of people were stuck in this loop of a rebooting process too. And I think proactively, no one ever prepares for this, but when you do communications during an outage, you have to consider the technical component of it, of making sure you have a technical expert in-house that can think of the repercussions of that and can think a little bit more proactively about solutions that wouldn't be considered textbook solutions. And that is IT, right? A lot of the processes we see in IT, they do have you know black and white fix to it. There's always a solution to the problem, but sometimes you do have to get creative. And I think that proactive part wasn't necessarily done to get creative about the recovery it was more hey here's what's going on nothing to worry about but also something to worry about and um i think that technical component they they could have done that better granted this industry has amazing people uh in it that were able to jump all hands on deck and basically um get some of those unique solutions out there yeah, I you know, and I would agree. And the, and the technical challenge is, is always going to be there. I think one of the things that I was most impressed was, and you, you hit on it very early on, was their communication strategy and their availability and, and their their quickness and transparency of getting out in front of this thing. I mean, you know, this thing's going on 
um, early Friday, you know, by Friday afternoon, you've got the CEO on all the major channels. He's out talking to people. Your CISO's out talking to people. And they had a really good crisis communication plan. Now, mm -hmm. you and I both know what's going on in the background is probably the most chaotic thing you can imagine. But, you know, forward forward facing, they did a really good job of, of really getting out to have a communication plan. And I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about uh, in just a few minutes. I'll share a slide, you know, some slides that we have on, you know, folks on the line can look at and, and think about, okay, what did you do if you were affected or, you know, what could you have been thinking about if your organization had been affected? So a lot of that is going to come up with crisis communication, both instant response and, and business continuity. So, you know, from a, from a lessons learned perspective, um, did Black Point Cyber and you as a whole and your customers, you know, are there any lessons that you could share that you think some folks learned from the incident as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say for us, uh, communications, obviously, we're going to be a big part for us. Our platform integrates with all major EDRs, including Falcon. So um, we surprisingly didn't have much of an impact um, as we would have thought within our customer base. Um, but with that being said, the way that we do it, and it's specifically around what kind of what you're talking about right now is communications. Is, and it's a lot of what my team does. Um, the Adversary Pursuit Group, we're focused on threat intelligence and threat research. So part of that is intelligence gathering. And it's basically having, you know, my top analysts and our director from the minute something happens, scraping everything that they know about it and being able to gather to confirm, like, here's what it is. Here's what we know. And getting it out as soon as possible across all socials, in emails, advisories to our partners that they can then send down to their customers. That's really step one is just getting a lay of the land of here's what we know. Here's how you should what you can do. Here's how to respond. And then from there, we move into the research portion of it. And so that's where my reverse engineers were basically going in and pulling apart um, the uh, file in and of itself that the update file that was going to be an issue um, and finding unique areas that were going to be probably a problem when it comes to the reboot stance as well. So then we want to post the, that research information. And it's just kind of a constant communication of what our team was doing. Um, while on the other side, we have the full SOC, so our threat operations center, where we have our detection team now being able to go across all of our look through our telemetry, go across all of our data sets and be able to understand if we have any impact to customers or if we're going to see opportunities of other threat vectors that would be coming out, being the social engineering aspect, um, being the targeting of underlining processes, perhaps of those systems or those organizations that were using Falcon. Um, so we do have unique visibility to try and be proactive for the customers that would be impacted. Um, to the best of our ability. So that's awesome. that's kind of where Blackpoint took a stance on it and specifically APG is. We want to at least gather as much intelligence as possible so that people feel like they're in the know and they're not just reading CrowdStrike's website hoping for an update every hour and there's not going to be an update. So yeah, exactly. And you know, you know, I think our lessons learned was really just making sure that we work with our companies and our organizations and customers to make sure that they do have the instant response and crisis management plans and business continuity plans in place. Uh, you know, as as to not being a single point of failure. Uh, and and we really were working hard toward that up until Friday. There was a lot of things you could look at Gartner, you could look at Forrester and we were trying to get, you know, to single points where we, we had one area where we could see all things. And, and now you kind of have to, as you mentioned earlier, we're going to step back and look at our business, you know, continuity plan and determine what we need to do. So I think really a lesson learned that we're going to be working with our customers on is, is how to make sure that they understand what critical plans they need to have in place. Obviously, you know, we do a lot of professional service consulting work where we're doing instant response and business continuity tabletops. We're going to touch base on why those are important too. But, uh, you know, we we actually find that because of compliance and different things like that, people are supposed to be doing them. And that's one thing that really slides, you know, under the radar. Before we transition over to really talking about more broader topics and, and really talking about how could you have been ready, what are some things you can do leading up to it? 
Um, what I want to do is stop here real quick and just ask you, uh, you've been referring to your team. We've referred to Black Point Cyber. Tell the audience a little bit about Black Point Cyber, what you guys do, um, and why, you know, that plays an important role in, you know, when you look at instant response and business continuity. Yeah, of course. So we are an MDR, managed detection response company. Under the hood, we're a software company. We do have um, proprietary nation state grade technologies that we use. Um, and then we supplement a lot of what our underlying platform detection system is built to supplement it through integration with EDR, um, all the major EDRs um, out there. Outside of just that, though, we really what we want to focus on is developing products within our product suite that enhance this visibility from our security operations center. So we do manage application control. We do Azure single sign on. We have G Suite or Google sign on. We are looking for specifically identity detection is the big portion of it. Um, cloud response capabilities. We're trying to build out products that help not just our customers have better visibility and also our analysts have better ability to respond and triage and remediate. But the biggest thing is when it comes to MDR and why you need it is it's 24 seven, right? You need a SOC. SOCs aren't necessarily going to be, they need to be a follow the sun model. I think you said it yourself, Chris, as far as this isn't necessarily a security incident, but this outage absolutely would impact a security operations center. If you're all going home by 5 PM, right? They're all coming back into the office. So I think the importance of MDR is specifically around that availability and security monitoring aspect as systems come back up online. So that's what Blackpoint does. We have a full product suite. I run a team within our threat operations center of Blackpoint called the Adversary Pursuit Group, and we do that threat intelligence and threat research. So in cases like this or emerging threat actor groups, or actually what we do a lot for our specific customers that we monitor, when we're doing triages of cases that have more sophistication to them, a little bit unique components that require malware analysis, reverse engineering, uh, potentially POC development. Um, and then of course, attribution, right? If we can tag, if we can look at an incident that one of our analysts is investigating, trying to remediate, we can give more context to say, hey, this is the Akira group, or this is Black Hat, and this is typically what else they do. So now you can hunt across the systems for that particular customer if there are loose threads and you don't necessarily have the full story yet. So APG helps enable, give context and enable the SOC to get that full story. Um, and then Blackpoint in and of itself, providing not just the MDR, but that full suite of products so that one, it helps our analysts and two, it offsets costs for our partners. Um, we wanna make sure that whatever we develop has uh, there's a rhyme to a reason, right? It has a purpose to it. Um, so it's going to be helpful in the areas that we see fit. You know, the areas that people aren't necessarily doing correctly right now, unfortunately, or they misconfigure, which is any sort of zero trust implementation. We want to, the emerging cloud threats in and of itself, right? We're like five to one on our cloud cases um, versus on-prem based cases. So we have to be able to build products to match what we're seeing out in the field today so that we're providing um, the the same efficacy level that is expected of us that you would want any security team to be able to provide. Well, and being a partner of Black Point, and we use it here and being the CISO at Infosystems, I can tell you the thing that I like best about Black Point is one, I trust it. And two, I get to sleep at night. It, you know, one of the worst things that what you do as a CISO or anybody in technology is you go to bed every night going, okay, is this the night I'm going to get that 3.30 phone call? Or is this the night that I'm going to, you know, be awakened by whatever? And, you know, there's so many, there's so much confusion from MDR and EDR and what do you do? And the thing that I like so much about Blackpoint is it it'll, it really looks at all of it. And, you know, it keeps the logs for me if we're using logic and we're doing different things. And so I know there's a lot of schools on here as well that, you know, one of the challenges you have is, okay, what can I monitor? What network, you know, do I have to monitor all my students? You know, we don't want to do that. Or, or what do we need to do? And, you know, we can work in McKinsey's team and, and the Black Point team can work with you to, you know, work through those kind of things. So really Black Point is just, they bring a lot of really exciting things. And again, I get to sleep at night. And uh, so far, you know, I, I think I've had two phone calls since we've been working with you guys. And, you know, you, you rule out the 99% of, you know, the false positives that we get 
because unfortunately we get <laughs> quite a bit of those um, to the point, you know, when one of your employees actually uh, fishes themselves when you're using, a, you know, InfoSec and before and they freak out and start calling everybody, uh, you know, it was nice just to touch, touch base with Blackpoint. Well, let's, uh, let's move into more of a broader product now. And I'm going to share my screen with the group and hopefully everybody's going to be able to see that. Um, so what I have here, what I want to talk about in the group, and we were talking about the, what did you do or what would you do if something were to occur? So what, what we've done is we put together kind of a, a couple of slides here that say, okay, if this was your organization and you woke up Friday morning and you were having outages, were these things that did you think about? So, you know, immediate action, maybe the first one to seven days, we're still in this particular component. Um, you know, have you thought about your, you know, engaging your instant response and crisis management team? So do you have one, you know, or is it a bunch of people that have to get together and, Mackenzie, I, I will let you coming from the Microsoft world and the IRL world, any uh, any tips to the folks that they don't really understand what's going on in an IR room until they get in there and what, you know, the chaos that goes on? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, so a big part of my job was actually putting together um, pretty much if you have an incident and you work with Microsoft, it goes through layers within Microsoft to escalate up to Dart. And by the time I get on the phone... My first step is to be able to just gather as much information as possible. So likely it, it didn't just, it happened, but 12 hours has passed. So I'm looking at a room with an angry CISO, um, uh, terrified directors, and a whole bunch of IT system administrators and security analysts that have done the best to be able to basically stop the bleeding. So the first part of that job in incident response is there's chaos it's very emotional. Unfortunately, I'm also trying to hand them contracts to sign at the same time. So nobody wants to sign on the dotted line when, uh, except when things are really bad, actually, maybe might, might be more pressing to sign anything at that point. But um, the, the other part is gathering enough information so that we can stop the bleeding, right? And, and for us, it was restoration of services and restoration of the business itself as the objective. And we couldn't do that until we stopped the bleeding, limited the scope of damage, and then moved into full-on tool deployment. Because in order to do an investigation, you also need to have visibility as you're bringing systems back online, ensuring that those systems that are compromised are isolated, and then putting full tools out so that your team can do their job to investigate and see where the source of the problem is. And that's the biggest thing to realize when you're going into an incident um, and, you know, knock on wood, I hope no one on this call ever has to experience it. But if you do, um, just consider like outside of the the high tailed emotions, we often put a lot of plans in place, never expect them to go perfectly as expected. That's kind of a misconception with tabletops, too. I've ran hundreds of tabletops in the past 10 years. Um, I can't stand tabletops. Please don't ask me to do one because I've done so many. I feel like I I got my little, I did my tour. I got my badge. I'm done. <laughs> but ultimately, people expect it. We we plan so much as we should, but never expect it's going to go to plan. And the biggest thing to rely on is the knowledge of your people and the ability of your people to think on their feet, to act quickly, and to have multiple processes that they can choose from. Because that stop the bleeding containment part of incident response happens in the immediate phase simultaneously while you have legal pr communications there's all these other components that come into play so i may be on the phone with the CISO, with the investigative team with my investigative team with 20 lawyers all at the same time trying to understand technical language and that can be extremely frustrating and difficult so don't, I mean, those are the immediate things when you walk into a room of, of people experiencing an active incident, there's going to be different priorities and objectives for each different role within that room, but you still have to speak the same language, which is why planning is so important, but don't expect the plan to go perfectly. And then you can fix the plan once you're all said and done and the business is restored. But until then, just have like reasonable expectations. Yeah, you know, you talk about doing tabletops, so and we're going to, there's a couple of slides near the end here that we're going to touch on kind of the way that it works and the artificialness of it. But I will tell you, and I was going to tell the story there, but I, I couldn't resist now. I, I would challenge you that the next time we have to do, and you won't complain about what I'm going to challenge it, 
the next time we have to do a tabletop for one of our large healthcare customers in this little state of Hawaii, um, you would want to go out there and do one. That was a, it was a two and a half hour tabletop that I did that I threw everything at them and the kitchen sink. And they had every notebook. They had every I dotted, every T crossed to the point. I said, guys, a hurricane's coming in. You know, here's the situation. And the guy goes, I know. How many days out are we? And, you know, he pulls out a notebook and he just starts going through and he has everything just clearly defined of, okay, um, yeah, well, so your generators went down. No, probably not. We have two big ones, you know, and I realized that when you're in Hawaii, you have to be pretty much ready for everything at any point in time. So when we do that one again, I may be calling you just for the fun of it to say, okay, see if you can, you know, stop McKenzie. Maybe that's a new, uh, that may be a new um, podcast you and I should do. We, we'll do yeah. stuff, you know, stuff McKenzie. Well, one of the things <laughs> in that you were talking about was talking about, you know, information management. You talked about what you guys did as a team on Friday. And you can see these last bullet points down here of the predefined crisis management team, uh, the designate the communications team. This is one of the things that I think I see more than anything that when you do the tabletops and when you when you start doing this and you're planning, everybody's there but the marketing and the PR teams. And, yeah. you know, it's how are you going to communicate out? What are you going to communicate out? You talked about a little earlier going out, you know, you try to find out and getting as much information out to all the different social media channels that you want to or that you can. And, you know, but I know that Black Point had a plan. You had a strategy. You guys weren't just releasing information into the wild. You weren't letting employees release information. So really in talking about this, if if your organization on the line where, you know, you guys were going through it, what was your crisis communication plan? Or better yet, if have you ever tested it? Do you know what your marketing messages are going to be? Who is responsible for speaking on behalf of the organization? So if like for Black Point, McKenzie and John, the president and CEO of the company, they're the two faces of Black Point. Um, myself and our CEO have been designated as the faces for us. And so we will be the ones talking to media. And and it's not as easy as it sounds, McKenzie. You know, a lot of people think, oh, that's, you know, we can put a crisis communication plan together. But that is, that's as time consuming as really the technical side of it. Right. I, I do think um, like internally we do just as you would in, in another incident um, for us when we're looking at outages like this, we do a war room and we make sure that we have someone from marketing that is high up enough that can now delegate and disseminate the information we're giving because that's the first step is just getting a lay of the land and being able to get that out there to our customers who were impacted or not impacted. Um, you know, education is power, right? Having awareness is extremely valuable. And that information is also, uh, it's its its not static. It needs to continuously evolve, sometimes get updated. Um, and people want to have a pulse on the situation as more information arises. So I think that that's kind of the key point that people forget is start with an internal war room that has all the appropriate people. Um, because that's the other thing, like you said, I don't want to have a planned speaking thing or a panel and all of a sudden or you know a webinar with Chris Bevel and then all of a sudden we're talking about CrowdStrike because that that's what happens that's the reality of it and then not know the details of what we did and how we responded and so even if an organization's not impacted you still have to have that knowledge and awareness of how others were potentially impacted um, our job is to obviously be able to provide details, education, remediation steps, while simultaneously looking internally with our security teams and saying, okay, look across all our partners, their downstream customers and clients, and, and make sure that they are safe and they're good to go. And then another aspect of that is, depending on what your business is, is making sure that you're communicating support measures, whether it's through you or whether it's through a designated partner. Um, you really do want to have some sort of lines of communication where where can they go if they think they were impacted by it because i'm pretty sure everyone has i've never i've never seen an event like this where you know for the next few years the blue screen of death is going to be a ptsd that everyone got educated overnight about simple it stuff 
<laughs> overnight yeah. they got educated and and it probably caused way more conspiracy theories that needed to be created out there but everyone at least knows the blue screen of death and i feel bad because that happens also in normal regular it issues so everyone's gonna panic every time they see that which is yeah you know that funny, i think not the, funny but the the picture that's ingrained in my head on the blue screen of death is the picture of new york which is where you are you know Times square and the big blue screen of death is up yeah, there yeah. You know what we do, what you know what you don't want to do is panic. And and you know you mentioned another component this this bottom bullet here, you know having dedicated IT experts and, and you know really you have your war room, you have your instant response, you know incident team that gets together. But it's really more than that. It's those dedic those dedicated IT experts that are back behind the scenes because probably a lot of the folks on the phone here and, and you and I and the folks, we, we're technical. So we kind of understand a little bit about what's going on, but think about that end user, uh, the accounting person, you know, that's the CPA that all of a sudden their computer's not working right. Or the administrative person, who are they going to go and, and how are they going to get it? And what are they going to try to do? So again, having a plan in place to communicate out, here's who you go to, here's who you contact, here's what you do so that they can bring it up and you can bring it up correctly. Because as you mentioned, there was a lot of things posted and there's a lot of things out there now that people are just trying to go get information, which creates a, a major risk, which, okay. you know, we look at the next slide is, um, it, you know, we've, we talked about the track, you know, the, the triage process, um, the straggler machines are something that we're going to, you know, talk a little bit about here coming up as well. And these are the ones that I think probably will most worry me as a CISO, probably you guys as a security component of people are going to be like, okay, my, my machine didn't come out. So let me go out here and do this, or let me go grab this tool. And as things become more along the lines of being installed and they didn't really let people know, those are the machines that most worry me is because people are trying to fix it any way they can. Right. And you know, I think that's a, that's a, a real concern. The other thing is, and I think, you know, we've seen a lot of that is this cloud and bullet point of avoid overreaction. And I think that's where a business continuity and instant response plan is so important as well Is if you have a plan, you know, you you know what you're going to do, you know, at least how you're going to try to get there. You know, it, it's your map. It's how to get there. And I, I think that's a, a component I think we've seen overreaction early on, but I, I think for the most part, everything seemed really relatively cool as they went through this. And I think that's one of the things I want to, you know, stress to the folks on the line too, is that I don't think CrowdStrike, you know, panicked. And I don't think there were overreactions there because they could have gone multiple ways and they did a really good job of it. And again, they probably had a very well, you know, defined plan and strategy. And if you have that, figured it out yet Mackenzie and I are really stressing having a plan and really knowing what to do so Mackenzie the next slide you know gets us into the long-term activities you know the eight to 12 weeks out so we're out and now everything signed kind of the same be back up and running you know now what so obviously the folks can read the screen you know review and prevention response you need to do the testing but from a cybersecurity perspective and your background and, you know, with what you've learned at, at Black Point, what are the recommendations that you would encourage for folks from eight to 12 weeks out? Well, I can tell you it's not um, strange to me as far as uh, during incidents or cases that we've remediated, got the customer back up and running, that they were hit a week later, a month later, five months later, six months later. And that's really because there's just so much we can do outside of configuring your entire infrastructure ourselves and enabling MFA and rotating creds and putting in the proper zero trust mechanisms and doing all the things that need to be done. And that's the biggest thing is when you experience an incident, and at least what from my experience on incident response teams, as we'd always say, we want to leave you better than we found you. And that's better than where you were before you got compromised, because at some point, there was weaknesses or flaws within your system that were exploited and there's gaps that you don't know about. And I think that that's really the long-term impact is, especially even considering with just an outage, the long-term impact, 
you're going to need security monitoring is the biggest thing because you're going, there's going to be, like I said earlier, we're going to see phases of types of targeting that are going on by threat actors who want to take opportunity around this. And I have no doubt that CrowdStrike is probably going to release um, some sort of advisory or information or guidance around what their concerns are um, coming from whether it's their Overwatch team or the company as a whole. But you need to have security monitoring, whether that's MDR or you build it yourself. That eyes on glass is so important for the next 12 weeks as systems come back on online. The other thing is going back and checking like baseline configuration changes. Like you said, overreaction. I'm I'm concerned, one, definitely decommissioning people sh shopping right now for EDR when they shouldn't be, right? Just assuming that, um, well, that messed up, so I don't want to be in the same situation. Um, that's business decision. It's very valid. Just like if you want to pay the ransom or not pay the ransom, everything comes down to a business decision by the org. But just having considerations that not only is that an overreaction, but whatever IT teams, IT teams will start doing to change the baseline configuration of the systems so that it doesn't happen. So creating new solutions that could also have impact. Whether you do that or not, it's the testing that now needs to happen. We need to do security testing, pen testing. We talk a lot about this on APG is actually like, you know, out of all the critical vulnerabilities, we'll talk about, you know, Palo Alto and um, Fortinet and, you know, AnyDesk. And it's just a constant role of critical vulnerabilities. But the whole point that we say is, wow, that amount of vulnerabilities per year and per quarter is increasing over and over. We're concerned with post-exploitation detection. How are you monitoring and how where are threat actors going to go once they hit those systems? Right. Do you have tamper protection on just as the most easiest thing when you're installing some sort of system? It's really important that outside of just monitoring and baseline configuration, the changes that you're making are tested. And this type of outage is a perfect example of why you need to say, OK, for the next 12 weeks, we recovered, but we're going to do some pen testing. Right. We're going to go around and do some general risk assessment of our systems. Let's do some inventory of our privileged users and of those privileged systems. And then, of course, you're going to want to say, let's go and look at our business continuity and disaster recovery plan, because there's probably some updates that need to be made. I have a feeling that this type of example is, I, you know, there's a silver lining to everything. We're going to redefine business continuity after this. Because it is the business part that people always forget. While it is an IT issue, there's the business part that's going to take the biggest hit from this. And that's solely on uh, even just your contracts going forward and these SLAs, statements of work, things you have in play with your providers by overreacting, by not testing, by doing certain things. You're just going to put yourself in greater harm than, than do good in the long term run. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, besides the cyber side of the house, you know, I think one of the things that we see is this this bullet point, the check and update downtime procedures. Uh, as I've done so many tabletops, it's, you know, what, how fast can you come back up? Do you know where all your data is to be able to bring that up? And did, you know, have you monitored that? So, you know, one of the things I would encourage folks is, you know, as we, and as we talk about the, the tabletop exercises that you might do, or if not, go really, know what how long you how long it's going to take to come back up i think the story that resonates in my mind is you know we all remember the colonial pipeline incident and you know the reason that and they went down and what really stuck out about the post-mortem on that was they actually had a business process and a plan and a continuity plan and they wound up paying the ransom because the ceo had panicked and he didn't think they were coming up fast enough and giving their time so they didn't know what their time, you know, time to up would actually be. And because of that, he, he paid, he got a key. And as we know, most of the times when you pay with ransom, you don't get everything that you expect. And they actually went slower. And then, and that's just an example of if, if they'd have tested and if he would have known that, that would have been, you know, really significant. So right. we've been talking a lot about testing and, you know, planning for it. So Mackenzie and I have talked about a tabletop and why that's important. You know, we, we talked about what took place on Friday and we made that decision kind of to do that really because we could put you through a false exercise, but this is one you're still going to hear about. But, you know, generally it's going to, it's going to involve some sort of hypothetical attack scenario. You know, it can be anything from a typical incident of a ransomware attack to one 
that I actually had a, a client and McKenzie, you'll love this one. Uh, the client actually, you know, wanted to have a situation where they had a disgruntled employee who then set a fire in the data center. And then in addition to that became an active shooting situation. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, and, you know, and it was up in an area where you are. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they wanted to test all that. And what they were trying to test was not only their being able to come back up from a business continuity perspective, but, you know, they were looking at how well they worked with the fire department, the police department, how well, you know, did they have all of their timing down? So we can test multiple, multiple things. You know, one of the challenges I think is, you know, while a lot of people see the, the simplicity as we look right here at the exercise, you kind of believe that responding to a real attack would be that smooth and you hit on it. It, it, it is not. It is chaotic and it's not that smooth because when we're doing a tabletop, we may try to test somebody, or, you know, we, we might do things, but you just can't re recreate the the attack focus, you know, right. For example, you can't recreate sitting in your email after you just got off that first conference call and you personally get the letter from the Conti group, you know, to you personally telling you that, it, you know, if you continue to help, they're going to come after your company. They're going to come after you. Um, you know, not a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad Conti's no longer really around. But, you know, that occurred to me, and, and that's something that, to really talk about, too, that we talk about in there, and that is having your, you got to have a secondary communication plan as well. And this occurred over the weekend, was how do you com communicate when Teams isn't working, when Zoom isn't working, you know, what, what do you do, what is your secondary source? And, and maybe it is working, but maybe it is compromised, which was our case, we jumped on the customer's team's call because we weren't thinking that quickly. They they were panicked, and so we just jumped on, and the Conti group was actually listening because they were already in. And, uh, you know, those are the things that you want yeah. to think about. But think about this weekend for the folks on the line. How would you have communicated if your teams and your Zoom are and, – and, heck, for that matter, the, the texting was down. You know, your phone was down depending on what happened. So those are some things we want to look at. From it, what you're going to do is you're also going to realize the need for further input and authorization. And let's, you know, touch on this one real quick. We've got about 12 minutes left and we want to allow for some questions. But, you know, Mackenzie, you even touched on it is who has authority? And I think you find that a lot of times in the in the tabletop exercises and when you actually test this, that who is who has the authority to do what? Who makes the call in the room? You know, that, I think that's a unique scenario and um, any comments there or thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, we did this. That was the biggest recommendation I would have doing tabletops is helping them build out a racy matrix, responsible accounted, consulted and informed um, around anything, but especially when it comes to things like recovery of systems um, or um, not just bringing systems back up online, but anything from uh, PR messaging that needs to go out um, uh, changes to uh, plans as far as what customer contracts look like after the fact, uh, whether you're giving credit back or you're providing uh, identity monitoring, right? Everything has everything has a person who is the designated sign-off person. And then they have others that are consulted because of their expertise. And then you have those that are informed because it's going to impact their business unit. So having that RECI matrix was probably the biggest thing that we would say in any tabletop needs to be in place because we need to know who's the one that's going to be answering most of the questions for us and who are going to be those that are qualifying those questions based on their knowledge. Um, having, you know, they're not, we're not going to go into a situation like you would with an audit where your CISO is the one sitting there and they're answering all the questions for the auditors. That CISO hopefully has a team of people behind them that is providing evidence that is validating and verifying the information and that it has tested whatever information also for process purposes, giving that to the CISO. So CISO, while they would make, as an example, maybe there's no CISO's IT director, manager, but that person is, while they're signing off, they definitely need to have those that consult them, that are helping them make that educated decision um, because we don't want to see, uh, we want to see the collective agreement and of those that actually work in the systems all day long, 
um, to be able to provide those recommendations um, going forward. So yeah, I would say that that's the biggest thing that would come out of most tabletops is just figuring out who answers the questions um, based on their role and based on their level of authority. Yeah. And I think in addition to that too, is, uh, you know, understanding your insurance coverage and, you know, when, when that incident is occurring, when do you call your insurance company? When do you get them involved? And so yeah. many people in the tabletop state, do we have insurance? I don't know. Yeah, we do, but maybe we should. And, you know, there's a whole, as you well aware, there's a whole strategy of when you call them, when not to call them. You know, you call your IT company, they get involved, and then the insurance company won't reimburse because you didn't get them in and didn't use their component. So it's a it's such an important part. And I think one of the other things we want to, you know, quickly point out as well is, and, and love to hear your thoughts on it, what I stress to a lot of people is it's an event, it's an incident, it's a situation, it's a challenge, whatever is going on when you're dealing with something like this, it is never a breach until yeah. your legal team defines it as a breach. You know, don't call it a breach. And that goes back to that crisis communication and your people beginning to say, if they go out there and you define it and declare it a breach, uh, you've got a lot more problems on your hands now than you did when it was an incident or something similar. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say you just quit it, during an incident. You figure out all of a sudden lawyers become your best friend. They're the people you love the most in the room. Um, and definitely the people that you would call prior to your cyber insurance. You want to have representation by those that are protecting you um, and have and understand your company. They understand your mission. They understand your people. You want those people there that are navigating it because cyber insurance is, while very re necessary, part of of this life cycle we have in in IT and security um understanding that contract is also necessary there are things that won't be covered there are things that can indemnify you there are things that maybe wouldn't necessarily um not just be covered but could um you could lose coverage after the fact if you don't follow certain requirements and we get lost in the sauce when it comes to those contractual obligations and so having general counsel there to some degree whether it's third party or in house is so imperative because you want to not just have cyber insurance, but they often are helpful in that decision making process to everyone else who is signing off. Um, there's just again, they're just like the biggest component only because I've done enough incidents and been on enough calls where there was plenty of lawyers around um, and it wasn't to the benefit of me <laughs> and our team, but it was certainly to the benefit of, of the victim organization. And they were there helping really herd the cats and really make sure that those um, decisions that were being made were in the best of both the company um, and the customers that they were serving. Absolutely. So we've got one last slide I want to put up and then we're going to want to open it up. But one of the things that we've talked about is, is planning and testing is so important. And there's a lot of folks on the line, again, we know from schools. Uh, so you've got some CMMC components, some NIST 800-171 requirements. You've got many, many, many other types of requirements as well. So these are some of the reasons that you need to do your instant response and business continuity planning as well. Uh, you can see how it can reduce impact as well as help you make sure that you're, you know, you're being compliant uh, in, in, the, in the course of things. So today, Mackenzie and I have covered a lot. We've gone back and forth and yeah, we did call an audible on you guys, but we thought it was important to talk about the, the CrowdStrike component. And I think in, in a lot of ways, I hopefully it was helpful in that you were able to hear from a couple of folks that, you know, live it and breathe it every day. Um, you know, Mackenzie, one, I want to say thank you uh, while we're opening it up for questions to join me today. It, it's always to work with you. Um, it, it's just a lot of fun. And, and you're so smart. And, and you know, it's uh, she's also a good luck charm for those that are out there. Uh, <laughs> she um, gets to go to a lot of the Grand Prix races. And the time that I first met Mackenzie was in Nashville. And she was asked to sit in one of the Andretti boxes and the, the, the driver had never won. And he actually pulls in a win with McKenzie in the box. And I think McKenzie, you might've been somewhere this weekend where you pulled it off again. I, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, he got P2 this weekend. So he was able to podium and, um, that was, and then his teammate got first. So it was a big win for Andretti this weekend too. And yeah, so who, you, who knew, you, who knew you, I would be into racing now, but if you need uh, a good luck that. charm, McKenzie is absolutely your good luck charm. And if you need a great MDR provider, Black Point Cyber and their organization works very, very well. We partner with them on a routine basis here at InfoSystems. 
uh, you know, we'll be happy to work with you guys to to help talk more about it. Uh, in addition to that, we'll help with tabletops. And in fact, I'll try to talk Mackenzie into doing one. If you guys came, I'll call her and try to beg her and, and see if she'll come do it. We'll see what a real instant response tabletop looks like. Not those that I do. So, <laughs> um, you know, Amy, we'll open it up. Do we have any questions that have come in via the chat? We really can't see much. So we'll, we'll rely on you guys to let us know. Uh, and be happy to take any questions with the five minutes we have remaining. Sure. So in, if you, if you're able to see the Q and a, there's, there's a yeah. couple of questions in there that are under published. So what is the balance between automation and human interaction for investigating and responding to alerts? What cannot be ingested into logic? And if nothing, how much interaction can users have with logic data for an investigation? So, I mean, this is really the, I get the first one, as far as the balance between automation and human interaction for investigating and responding, automation is huge right now. For us, it's a lot what Chris was talking about a little bit earlier on like false positive rates, right? We have, that's a normal part. We don't even want to say like, I, I know my SVP would probably kill me right now because he's like, no, he doesn't like the term false positive too. And I understand the reasoning, but that's what we all universally understand right now is um, understanding what is considered normal behavior in your environment, especially false positives on users, especially when it comes to cloud response. So automation is huge. It's basically suppressing things that you know are based on your configuration that those alerts are going to continue, but you don't want to lose what's considered out of a hundred false positives, that one that is considered malicious. So automation can help suppress some of the noise but it won't remove the alerts entirely to where you're going to need to have a connection. Often when one alert comes in that's considered a low, lower fidelity of an alert, that's going to come with additional activities from the threat actor themselves that will supplement that alert with other alerts. So you want to be able to go back in time and gather it up and be able to say, yes, I can validate this without a, without a doubt. But automa automation is extremely important for calming down some of that noise because certain things like successful logins of RDP is going to be a very difficult thing. This is where Blackpoint's actually building out our AI team because we want to look at some of those things that would help us not just automate, um, but start to train our analysts to get out of that tier one level and get them a little bit more elite, get them a little more advanced to start focusing on other triage capabilities. As far as logic, you can definitely reach out to Chris um, on that. I mean, when I can provide information on logic. I could sit here on a whole, I'd probably go on a five minute rant around um, Sims and, or Seams, whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, and how it is not, those aren't used to catch bad guys. So starting, right. like that's, they are a necessary thing though, from a forensic point of view for investigative stance. Those logs are extremely useful. Um, we can provide a whole list of the logs that are currently getting pulled into Logic. Um, and then there are going to be some future um, versions of Logic coming out, actually, that are going to pull in even more information around firewalls. Um, if, for instance, that is going to be really beneficial. So um, happy to feel free to reach out to Chris and we can get information on Logic. Yeah, you can you can throw me that one. And that's also, that's a McKenzie going, I'm throwing that to the compliance guy. So I love logic because I, it's, I, where McKinsey is the technical incident responder that can actually make the computer buzz and do its thing. Um, I'm the nerdy guy that reads the policies and procedures and all the compliance things. So yes, we can definitely get why that's so important from a logic as a whole. I think the other question, McKinsey, is what reporting can we provide that highlights your NDR team's response capabilities against competitors? Um, man, that's loaded. Good luck. That is loaded. Again, <laughs> reach out to Chris. No, we uh, we can definitely set up these calls because it's really hard. I, I know when people go to a website or marketing or they read a couple blogs or see some battle cards between competitors or what's offered, that's not the full story. It never is, unfortunately, um, of understanding. And then people tend to veer towards, well, I'll go for a cheaper thing because it includes this. But really, like as far as what our MDR teams provide, the biggest thing that I can see that is a misconception in the space of MDR, MM, XDR, the concept of managed EDR, right? There's a lot of differentiation of what those actually mean by an industry standard. And then also specifically the R, which is the response side of taking action. The biggest thing that we do is we actually prioritize if it is 
known bad, if it is confirmed malicious, that if it is high fidelity, we will take action on it. We will be calling and blowing up Chris at 3 a.m. If he, you know, for instance, so we, we will be sending calling as often as possible. But if we can confirm and validate that this is bad, we are going to take action on it. And then a lot of, you know, a lot of MDRs that you work with may not necessarily do that. So you can look at things like response times. That's a great measurement of ROI as far as what MDR you want to go with. You can look at the tools and capabilities they have for not just isolation and remediation, but what context they provide you after you've had an incident. And that's something type of reporting that, again, if you get hooked up with us, we can provide that to you and that information to you. Because we do believe that MDR really is not just the future, it's a, necess it's a necessity. Like it's something that has to happen. It's just not realistic that people can monitor 24 seven. It's not it's not feasible that people can build their own sock in an affordable budgeted way. And then you're forced to prioritize certain tools over others. And that's that's difficult. And then you throw in compliance on top of that and the requirements there. So you're spending all your money in a in a giant log dumpster, which is good, <laughs> but also it doesn't catch bad guys. And so it's it's really like when you start looking around this, please reach out to us. I'm happy to provide a person internally that can break down response times, our processes, the technology, stuff that you're not going to see on different competitors' websites too, right? You're not going to get the full story. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all the questions and I think we've reached time. So Mackenzie, man, it, it was a, as always exciting to be with you and, and a pleasure and look forward to our next time. For those that joined us, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to the Info Systems team. We'll get you in touch with Blackpoint as appropriate, and we'll answer your questions. So thanks, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the rest of your week. Have a great day. Thanks, all. Have a good week. Bye. -bye.